you <clears throat> seem to make all your decisions based off of uh, an objective <clears throat> performance outcome, right? Whether it's like, <clears throat> you know, do we don't need a six pack if John's going to beat the shit out of someone in 90 seconds, yeah. right? Like, yeah. you know, we need to, the, 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 what do you call it? The least best or the best worst <clears throat> option. Yeah. Something now, like that. When you're looking at <clears throat> performance as the proxy by which you make decisions, how do you wrestle with the emerging, or maybe it doesn't even cross your radar. How do you, how do you interpret the emerging, uh, health advice that's coming out purely not based off performance but having the focal point of longevity and health like you know yeah. uh, there's always the argument like is is peak performance healthy it's like well is it healthy to fight in the ufc and get your potentially your head mm -hmm. kicked in it's like well probably not is there a healthy way to do it yes yeah. but the market now seems to be the talking heads of the industry are very much health which i think should be always be in the conversation but longevity now is like the buzzword yeah. of the of the last couple of years yeah uh, uh, in my <coughs> we're here at <coughs> we're here at the swiss conference in columbus and in my presentation today i'm going to talk about the difference between health and fitness health being um, <coughs> the uh, absence of illness or injury show me somebody who's never been injured i'll show you somebody who's never won anything uh, fitness being the ability to perform a particular duty or task. And the fitness level, as you said, required to be a UFC champion or a world's strongest man or even a 14-year-old gymnast in the Olympics is not healthy. And your exposure to injury um, and even potential long-term problems, blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, etc. <clears throat> and so a lot of what I do is, is just try and mitigate damage for those folks while they're competing which I found can help them with their performance. And they may historically have felt as though they needed to make these sacrifices in order to perform better, but I, I try and educate them that, no, if we do it this way, you can, uh, you can achieve the same end, uh, but not potentially have uh, you know, the long-term deleterious uh, health effects. And you're right. Then there's a lot of general population nutrition advice that doesn't necessarily apply to athletes. Uh, whether or not it's good advice even for the general population is, is, is what is currently being debated on social media with the longevity industry in particular, as you mentioned, uh, to be specific protein intake. Uh, and just to say on the outset, <clears throat> I don't utilize uh, general population nutrition information or longevity information uh, as, a, as a reference or resource. I utilize the ISSN, the International Society of Sports Nutrition, uh, and their positions on uh, things like meal timing and, and uh, uh, protein intake, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if an individual watching wants to reference the resources that I consider to be uh, reputable and applicable to athletes, those are the ones that I would, uh, that's where I would direct them. Just the Journal of International Society of Sports Nutrition, they have position papers on all of that stuff. But what we've seen come out of the longevity industry, uh, we just touch on a few topics, as this is always a fun dive, because the, I think longevity folks are crazier than the bodybuilders. I mean, talk about experimenting with things that at least, at least steroids work. Yes. You know, and we understand wow. that, yes, so good. And, and we know the side effects and, yeah. and you know, it, it's, it's a clear path. We've had lots of research on that over many, many years. The stuff that these folks have been diving into is, is just uh, purely experimental. And I've seen some really smart folks. I, I hate it when people, um, what do you refer to it as, uh, appeal to authority. Mm. We'll reference one of these folks based on their academic achievements, uh, Harvard or their UCLA, you know, and, and, and much respect to them for that. But oftentimes they're uh, making claims that are outside of their um, domain-specific expertise, uh, nutrition claims in particular. Most of these Harvard folks that are making nutrition claims aren't nutritionists. So I, I look at PhDs in nutrition for that information. Um, and uh, so specifically protein is kind of the biggest one. And we've seen that come out of uh, <clears throat> um, David Sinclair, uh, Walter Longo, those camps about uh, mTOR stimulation uh, and how that might be um, uh, actually detrimental to longevity. <clears throat> and, uh, but they have no evidence of that. They use their mouse research to, to show that. Uh, the primate research is equivocal, and they have no human evidence uh, to show that uh, protein restriction, and, and quite the contrary, there are PhDs in nutrition who would suggest that uh, because that's an acute stimulus and not a chronic stimulus, that that is actually a positive um, <clears throat> thing, the protein response, particularly as we age. We've got sarcopenia, we've got uh, anabolic resistance that occurs in, in uh, elderly populations, and increasing protein intake is pretty critical for those folks. They don't experience the same muscle protein synthesis from 
smaller doses of protein that uh, a younger athlete would. And so they need more protein just to, just to stimulate that um, <clears throat> and to retain their lean body mass. Uh, in addition, of course, to the training stimulus, and I think everybody's pretty much in agreement now that lifting weights is, is a priority. If you were going to choose, had to choose, although I don't think it's a dichotomy, uh, between <clears throat> lifting or cardio, that seems like the, 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 uh, the tables have turned now into where uh, weightlifting is, is probably the more essential, uh, uh, although cardio should be certainly included. So protein's the big one. Uh, Dr. Gabriel Lyons has been fighting quite aggressively for a number of years to, uh, to get people to recognize the importance of what uh, her and Donald Lehman have referred to as muscle-centric medicine. Uh, it's a fantastic message. Uh, you know, we're just fortunate to, to love lifting weights. And I never thought about this when I was a teenager, you know, muscle-centric medicine and, you know, sarcopenia. I just wanted to be jacked. And, uh, you know, just by <coughs> luck of the draw, I landed on a, uh, you know, a passion that uh, is also great for longevity, uh, the competitive aspect notwithstanding. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> but, uh, you know, so we focus on lean body mass and uh, those folks who are proclaiming that protein is, uh, you know, I guess it's kind of dose dependent, but they're really into to chronic calorie restriction because they, they see how it uh, helps with longevity for mice. Um, it, it just, it doesn't bode well for uh, human populations. We aren't mice, uh, and especially as we age. And so that's kind of the, some of the biggest information that's coming out of the longevity industry. And then from there, it's all of these supplements that are unproven. I find the resistance <laughs> training longevity crowd to like even still miss the boat. Because like, I, I, I don't know. There's no such thing as bad ideas, just bad incentives. I think that's like yeah. a Sam Harris quote that I really like. And I feel like the longevity industry has <coughs> as bad an incentive as the shreds marketing people. They yeah. just wanted to, they just wanted to make a bunch of money. Yeah. Right. I, I think the I will always revert back to the biggest guy in the room for advice because I think his incentives are, he wants people to get big. And I think that's, a, I mean, you know, big or strong or fast or athletic or however you want to measure it. I think the intentions always matter. So the intentions from the big guy at the gym or the shredded guy or the fast guy at the track are always, you know, maybe more aligned with the desired outcome than the intentions of these fringe markets that kind of swing in pendulum. Because, like, resistance training is more in vogue than it's ever been. And mm -hmm. I think and no one would argue that. But what I'm seeing come out of the longevity camp, like these fitness boomers that are 140 pounds talking about ruck marching as resistance training yeah. or doing like uh, curtsy lunges with like a two and a half pound plate. Like this must boil your blood. Like you are one of the strongest people, even to like, you know, I would say even, but like to this day, still one of the strongest people on the planet. Like, oh, it's my time for my weekly workout, 600 pound squat, <laughs> 600 pound deadlift. And it's like, do you think that, do you think that the longevity space is a net positive or negative even on the desired outcome that they're after let alone on like the industry at large <clears throat> even the people i just mentioned sinclair and and walter longo they acknowledge the big rocks the big rocks are seven plus hours of sleep high quality sleep uh, a healthy diet which whew, that opens up a lot of <clears throat> different variations there uh and regular exercise and that exercise now all of them recommend a, a including cardiovascular and, and resistance training. So <clears throat> in so much as those are the messages, um, and we understand that we have 70% overweight and obese, we have 40% of the population uh, with prediabetes or diabetes. Um, going back many years, I said, what's the best exercise? The one you'll do. And you know, if, that's, if that's the gap that you need to bridge, uh, then you want to meet the individual where they're at. If we're talking to 70% of the population who's largely sedentary and overweight, uh, then I think any message of exercise, whether it's rucking or it's battle ropes and burpees, which I despise, uh, which we can talk about later, um, any method of exercise, hopefully it's something they enjoy, which is kind of the most important thing I lead with, is what do you like doing? Uh, 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 <clears throat> just My wife has recently challenged all of our neighbors to pickleball tournaments in our driveway, and so, you know, at least the, everybody's out exercising, right? I'd move. <laughs> yeah. I'd move. No, <clears throat> I'm a new neighborhood. Yeah. So, uh, matter of fact, I woke up <clears throat> this morning with some knee soreness. So, like you said, I can go squat 600 pounds. I have no knee soreness. 
I play some pickleball and I discover that whole change of direction thing for old people is not a great idea. And I woke up the next morning all sore. But the point being, it was enjoyable. Everybody was out there. All the neighbors were running and playing and sweating and they were all purple in the face and breathing hard. And that's probably better than nothing. <clears throat> and that's kind of oftentimes where I have to meet people. I recently had a video go viral about talking about aspartame uh, and, and just uh, artificial sweeteners in general. And I talked about the fact that uh, when you replace sugar-sweetened beverages with uh, diet sodas, you see consistently see weight loss. And people started screaming and yelling about all the bad things about aspartame. And I'm like, as compared to what? At what dose, of course, when you're talking toxicity. But as compared to what? As compared to a sedentary individual who's you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight, drinking sugar-laden beverages. Um, and they'll talk about, well, there's cancer, um, you know, and, and even the... Even the worst animal research on that shows, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a cancer increase of maybe one percent, uh, whereas you've got a two to three hundred percent increase in cancer risk with obesity. So I'm, I'm saying, as compared to what, you know, and so you know, my goal would be to get people to exercise and to find the exercise that they enjoy. We, I don't say we, you, as an, uh, you know, uh, academically credentialed professional. You know, I'll take a we with me and you any day. <laughs> Anything that puts me in the same conversation as Stan Efferding, like I'm here for it. Yeah, who try and uh, uh, optimize performance would suggest there's better options. I just recently talked about how stretching did not improve performance, did not decrease uh, DOMS, um, uh, could actually inhibit performance. Uh, uh, and the stretching people, I didn't realize there was a, a, a stretching uh, religion full of uh, prophets and disciples, and they just descended upon me and attacked me for mentioning that. But as compared to what? Uh, you know, you, lifting through a full range of motion gives you the same mobility as, as static stretching. Uh, and there, any type of movement is better than stretching for DOMS recovery. So I was just pointing out that when you're uh, you know, looking at the 1%, when you're trying to optimize a program and you've got limited time and limited physical capital, what, you know, we're choosing the best, right? We're, we're, we're not going down the list. Uh, but having said that, if somebody, you know, if yoga is, is something that somebody enjoys and that gets them some exercise and uh, you know, yoga in particular provides some loading, whereas static stretching may not, uh, probably even more preferential than, than stretching because it's still exercise. The difference is we focus on training. Is it measurable and progressible, or is it just exercise? Nothing wrong with that for the general population. And, uh, but I think the nature of the conversation is, is that uh, there is a spectrum upon which we make these decisions and for whom.